The following presentation was sponsored and hosted by the Greater Hartford GNU Linux Users Group of Connecticut. This presentation was conducted on June 13, 2011 by John Sullivan, Executive Director of the Free Software Foundation. To join our group and to find out about our future meetings, please visit www.meetup.com slash ghglug. An hour, we'll be a little bit less, and then have plenty of time for a uh, conversation afterward. So, if there's contemporary issues that you want to talk about, um, everything that Michael said is true. I've started with the FSF in 2003, and uh, since then have done most of the jobs in the organization at some point or another. So, I'm familiar with, and at some level, with most of what we do. Um, uh, I'm not the expert on licensing, you know, but I, I have. A good understanding of how free software licensing works. And, uh, my position now as executive director is to work with Richard Solomon, the president, to run the organization, um, you know, keep us under a budget, uh, set our campaign targets and goals, and make plans for how we're going to reach out to the public and achieve the goals that the FSS is set up to achieve. Um, beside my uh, work at the FSS, I'm also available as an entertainer. <laughs> doing my Steve Jobs impersonation. Um, this was at the uh, Apple iPad launch in San Francisco. Uh, we decided to show up there with a small group of people to help let press and the public know about some of the restrictions that came along with the launch of the application store and the iPad. Uh, so I dressed up like Steve Jobs. Um, I don't think it's that great myself, but I was accused of being a paid Steve Jobs impersonator <laughs> in the media. Um, they actually reported that the FSF had paid somebody to dress up like Steve Jobs, and then they, they did pay me, and I was kind of paid, but uh, not specifically because of my Steve Jobs impersonation skills. Um, and uh, I won't show you my song. I'm in trouble if I do. Uh, so I thought I'm going to go through. Um, really all of the campaigns that we have going right now and uh, all of the resources that we offer and just give a, a brief summary of each one, go a little bit more in depth on a couple. And that's a little bit scattershot I know, which is uh, it's not a focused presentation about a particular issue, but my goal here is to give people a good sense of what the FSF actually does as an organization. Because I feel like um, most of the time when people think of us, they think of, of Richard Solomon and uh, the things that he says in the public media and the work that he does because that's the most visible thing. And that's true. He's obviously um, still our, you know, he still sets the FSF policy. He's our most important spokesperson. He's an important leader in the free software movement. But we also do a lot of uh, things beyond just what he does um, that uh, I want to share with people and that he wants us to share with people, you know, so that uh, they know everything that the organization does. Um, we have a, we're a 501c3 charity. We're based in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, we were started in um, 1985. So people are often surprised to hear that, that an organization which is working in this field, which has now become, you know, quite like kind of edgy and hip, basically. But we've been going since 1985. Um, and it was started a year after the GNU project in 1984. So this is kind of my statement of, uh, of what our mission is. Um, we're a worldwide organization. We do have some uh, sister groups, uh, Free Software Foundation Europe, Free Software Foundation uh, Latin America, uh, Free Software Foundation India, um, but uh, we are a global organization and we work with those groups in order to do a better job in specific areas around the world. But the FSF is uh, the, the global organization and we want to advance the rights of all free software users around the world. Um, and it's always been an important mission, but I think in, in the world now it's becoming more important because more and more people are having to interact with computers in order to accomplish anything at all in their lives. And because of that, whoever owns the computers and whoever owns the software that's running on those computers really has a lot of control over what kinds of things people can do. And, you know, as a random example, I was, uh, I was in an airport show. I was living in Seattle for a while while I was still working with the FSF and uh, there was a lot of travel back and forth. And the airport show driver picked me up and after a few minutes one of the other people in the van was like, don't they give you guys GPS? Because he was like trying to navigate to pick up a few more people and he didn't have a GPS in there. And the driver just you know, lost it from that. He went on a 10 minute rant about GPS and about how he doesn't need it. He's been driving the shuttle for a long time and uh, you know those things, they, they just slow you down. And then all the usual complaints that someone might have about new technology, but then he also said that 
those things will kill you. Huh? And I was like, how exactly does the GPS <laughs> kill you? And he's like, people just listen to the directions and it leads them, you know, right into a, a road that they're not supposed to be driving on. Or, and then he also had a conspiracy theory, which was that uh, companies are paying the GPS data providers to route people um, in certain ways. So, for example, a McDonald's <laughs> might pay so that the GPS directions route people as often as possible by McDonald's. And I was like, I, I'm a pretty conspiratorial-minded person <laughs> myself, and I never thought of that one. Uh, <laughs> But it makes some sense, and I don't know if there's any truth to it, but how would we know if there's any truth to it? You know, we, we can't see the code that's running these devices. So we're given, literally, in the case of a, like a GPS that you put on your dashboard, of a black box, it's like, and someone tells us what it's going to do, and then we kind of observe its behavior, and we decide for ourselves, well, it's working pretty well, it's not working pretty well. But of course, within that range, there's a whole lot of things it could be doing. You know, it could be taking us to McDonald's, uh, it could be driving us by particular billboards, and we wouldn't know, right? because we can't see the software that's actually running on the device. Now, I don't really believe that they can kill you. Um, you know, people get a car accident for all sorts of reasons, but I don't think the GPS software directly kills you. But one example of software that does actually uh, kill you or not kill you is the software that's running in medical devices. Uh, now, there was an attorney named Karen Sandler at the Software Freedom Law Center um, who provides us with uh, pro bono legal services um, when we need them, and so they're all people who are passionate about free software. And she re she published a paper last year about the software that's in um, heart devices, and about how uh, you can't see the code that's in those devices. And that's a very literal example of software that could kill you because it didn't have enough eyeballs looking at it, you know, to make sure that it did what it was supposed to do and did it well. And aside from the life and death issues, all of that, all the ways that we have to we use software now to communicate with each other, um, the, you know, you're sending messages through uh, Facebook, say, which uses um, proprietary JavaScript that's running in your browser. Um, and you don't know what that software is doing with text that you type in. And there's been cases, for example, Facebook was blocking messages that uh, had particular content in them. Um, and we interact with these devices, and to the, to the, the more they are like just black boxes, you know, the more we're giving up control to somebody else to decide the way our interactions actually happen. And of course, freedoms on paper matter, but if you can't exercise those freedoms without dependence, you know, your freedoms of speech, your freedoms of expression, association, if you can't exercise those freedoms without giving up some freedoms to people who own and control software, then you're in effect losing those core freedoms as well. Um, you know, voting machines. Uh, maybe we shouldn't be having computerized voting at all, but if we are going to have computerized voting, certainly the software that runs on those machines should be open for, should be free software, should be available. Everybody who depends on it and uses it should be able to, uh, to see it. So that's, you know, this is why the FSF, uh is concerned about software, not just from a making good software angle, and I mean, throughout its history, the FSF has been concerned with that. Um, the original purpose of the organization was to actually pay programmers to develop software. And, um, you know, they were proud of their work and it was important that software be made well. That's still an important theme and we still want good software, but we also want the, the ideas that go along with that software. So it's not enough for us to just get more people using free software. Uh, we also need to get people understanding the ideals that uh, go along with that. I'm going to find a terrible joke on me when I talk about good software. There we go. Um, so we want to advance not only the use of GNU Linux, for example, as a, as a good free software operating system, uh, but we want to get people to understand why uh, they should use that operating system even when it sounds good. So I, I have problems with my computer frequently, um, and sometimes people who use Mac OS X have fewer problems in that particular area than I do. Sometimes the proprietary software really does work better, um, but that's not the only reason people should be using free software. So if we are just trying to sell the software itself on its merits, then we are not advancing the mission of 
getting those ideas across because as soon as the software stops working as well, um, people, if they don't think, you know, if all software is the same, they'll use whichever web, web browser just works better. And if Opera works better, they'll just switch to that. There's no, the ideology, if you don't communicate that separately and, or at the same time you're getting people the software, then you don't get that same kind of, you're not building a movement, you're not building a, working on change in society um, as effectively. So it's important that we focus on that. So we do that by promoting free software, uh, getting people to use it, because getting people to use it is a good way to talk about the ideas. Like here, let me tell you about this program. Um, this is where it comes from. This is the context behind it. This is why I think you should use it. Uh, the video operating system is the way that the FSS has uh, pushed free software adoption most strongly. So we, as an organization, provide a lot of services for free software developers working under um, GNU and just make sure everybody is aware. The GNU was the project that was started by Richard Stallman in 1984 to create a fully free uh, operating system that people could use. At the time, it was to replace um, Unix, which was proprietary. But nowadays, it's you know to, to replace Windows and uh, Mac OS X as much as it is to replace Unix as being a you know, popular proprietary operating system that people are using. So that project is still going strong. Um, and the FSF provides you know, shell server, uh, bandwidth, web services, uh, source code uh, repositories, that sort of thing to help developers work with each other to advance this project. And developers in turn, in order to be part of the project, uh, agree on a set of uh, principles that by being a new project, they're going to um, be committed to, and that helps give the project not only technical cohesion um, because they use interoperable standards for, you know, building programs and uh, doing different things, but also gives ideological um, strength. You know, each developer now speaks, the, the group amplifies everybody's voice and everybody in that under the Gideon project is very supportive of self-recruiting. Uh, and then the other important thing that the FSEP does to protect user freedom is to run some public education campaigns um, to help get the issue of software freedom out into the mainstream media uh, and just in as many places as we can get it. And so sometimes these campaigns are focused on specific issues. Uh, digital restrictions management or DRM is one of those. It's one that we put a lot of energy into. We have a campaign called Defected by Design, which we launched and I'll talk more about in order to focus on that. Um, and you know, it, we work we work very broadly talking about uh, the importance of freedom overall, but it's really important to have specific campaigns and um, for these specific issues as they arise because that's the way people talk about things. Obviously, you get news stories written about them, and somebody needs to be there to present the free software side of things. Just make sure we're on the same page of what free software is. This is the free software definition. Uh, the numbers are off to the side there, but there are uh, four freedoms, starting number zero. Um, the freedom to run the program for any purpose is the, is the first one. Second is the freedom to study how it works um, and to change it. And that obviously requires you have access to the actual source code uh, of the program because otherwise you're stuck editing some you know, uh, binary file that's not made for humans. Uh, the freedom to share copies and the freedom to share your modified copies as well. So I've been thinking about these a lot lately and how we communicate them. Um, I have our, I brought some extra copies of our latest newsletter. Uh, anybody is free to take one of those. We just mailed a bunch of them out, so uh, some of you may have already gotten it. But I have an article in there talking about how we communicate these things to people that aren't familiar with computers and, more importantly, don't want to be familiar with computers. Um, they, and that is a fact. There are obviously a lot of people like that, and that's, that's fine. I mean, people like to specialize, um, and they want to work in a certain area, they don't want to learn about computers. It's not because they're not smart, it's because they have other things they want to do. Um, but we need those people in order to, just like any society that's founded on freedom, you have to have uh, support from a, a large group in society in order to have a freedom movement be successful. It can't just be uh, the people who are really interested in technology arguing for their own freedoms, first of all, that won't succeed. But second of all, the freedoms aren't just for programmers. And um, this is what I've been thinking about a lot lately, which is these, these freedoms end up mattering for people who don't, who are never going to edit source code and are never going to write a program. 
right? But the, they need programs that are made in freedom. You know, they need a GPS unit that's not going to route them by McDonald's. Uh, you know, for, and, and subtly try to influence their consciousness. They, they need a heart device that's not going to kill them because there was a stupid bug in it. Um, and I have been thinking about this in, in comparison to freedom of the press, for example. Um, I do happen to do a lot of writing, but a lot of people don't write, but they certainly understand that it's important um, for what they read that there be freedom of the press. Right? There needs to be a lot of different outlets who can operate and not be um, directed by the government in order for us to get good information that we all need to make our decisions. And in the same way, I think that we can talk to people about why software freedom is important, even if they're not going to write code themselves, they need to know that the people who are writing the code are doing so under conditions of freedom. You know, that, they, that those people uh, do have uh, the right to invest and innovate and share their work with each other and build on the work of their predecessors because that's how we end up with software that empowers us as opposed to software that uh, uh, helps people with a particular corporate interests or a particular, you know, any kind of interest. Um, so that's kind of what I've been thinking about for, for how to talk about the free, why source code is important, you know, why these freedoms are important even if people don't fully understand uh, how they are implemented by people that are taking advantage of them. You know, some of the freedoms are easy. It's easy to, to explain to people why they need the freedom to run the program for any purpose. Right, because if you start off in Microsoft Word, it shouldn't tell you. If you start off your word processor, it shouldn't say, uh, uh, wait a minute, it looks like you're writing um, something questioning Obama's birth certificate. You know, that's not allowed. Right, like your word processor should not try to dictate what um, you are allowed to say and not allowed to say when you're using the program. So people get that. Uh, the freedom to share copies is also straightforward. Um, people, we have to deal with the uh, unfortunate culture that's being created where people think that giving, sharing copies of things that can be infinitely reproduced at almost zero marginal cost with each other is, is wrong, but people understand what that means and how it could be valuable if uh, um, as long as people who are writing the software can be compensated and um, you know, we can still have software be written. That's pretty easy for people to understand that if those problems are answered, sure, if we can share infinitely, yeah, we should do that. Uh, and so it's really the other two freedoms, the ones that have to do with modifying the software that are trickier for us to explain. Um, and I, I'm always interested to hear people's ideas about that, you know, uh, what, because everybody kind of has the moment where they, or, or some story about how they heard about free software and how it started to make sense to them um, and how they got into it. And, and those stories are helpful for being able to reach out to more people. You know, and, and in a, a terrible way, uh, a lot of these companies are really helping us. The companies making proprietary software because there's moments when they overreach and try to enforce restrictions that are very, you know, egregious or blatant or cause people a lot of problems. You know, those moments um, wake people up and, and, and make them angry. And we, we don't wish that on anybody. Like, we're not happy when someone's entire music collection is destroyed because of Apple's, you know, iTunes DRM. Uh, but when they happen, um, those are those are times when there's a moment to explain, you know, to people, well, this is why that happens, and, and you know, there's a whole world over here where that will never happen to you, and uh, you should, you know, come join us. Um, at the same time, we are working against very effective marketing campaigns by those companies. Uh, Apple, in particular, now is is really pushing this idea that people uh, just want their computers to work, and that freedom is, in fact, a bad thing for them. And, and they've been very effective at it. So Apple's kind of whole system of devices now with the iPhone and the iPad and, and soon, you know, the desktop and laptop is moving in that direction as well, is really focused on keeping you in a, a walled garden. Um, you cannot install any third-party software that doesn't come straight from Apple, right? So you've lost even the, the freedom that Windows users have had for ages to, you know, just download a program off the Internet and install it on a computer. Um, and, and these restrictions are being sold by Apple with features. You know, they keep your computer more secure, they make it work better, they make the battery life on the iPhone better because you don't have, you know, applications uh, interacting poorly. And there's truth to all of those things, but the weird thing is that they, they're somehow managing to make the leap between those uh, advantages and the right to legally prohibit people from modifying anything on their devices. So we can all agree 
that there should be a, a world under which you might subscribe to different services. Oh, I like Apple's you know, editorial judgment about applications. Um, I like the fact that they make sure that all these applications work well together. So sure, I'll, I'll hook my device up to them. But the, the problem, and there's no problem with that, you can have that system in a free software world. Um, to some extent, we do have that system in a free software world. If you use a GNU Linux distribution, um, like you are probably subscribing to a particular you know, set of packages, a particular set of programs, and, and you get all of your programs from one place, but you're not legally bound to that place. If you decide you don't like it, you move to somebody else um, with your hardware. Right? And what Apple now is trying to enforce on people is say that you can't you can't leave Apple. If you bought the hardware, then that hardware is forever lost to Apple. And if you were to try to circumvent that, you're actually doing something criminal. Um, so that's uh, and they're they're pushing this message. Steve Jobs in a conference call about Android says almost explicitly that freedom is a, that choice is bad um, because that's why iPhone is better than Android because Android, you know, it's never going to work too long because it has to run on way more devices and the programs don't play nice together. And, you know, so this is, we're up against this idea that computers should be so simple that you should actually actively avoid freedom. With them. And that's a very, that's a very dangerous thing. Um, and we're doing our best to prevent it. And, and, but really, a lot of people are focused on trying to prevent it by making the free software just as good and work in the same way. Um, so you see a lot of interface movements towards Apple style interfaces. Uh, but it's also important to remember that we really should be counteracting this by encouraging a basic level of literacy among people using technology, you know, as much as possible. Like, you know, like I said, there will, there will be people who don't want any level of interaction with the technology at all, but um, there's a, a wide range you know, of people in that way, and there is a big group that we can appeal to to try to encourage people to learn basic uh, interacting with, how, how to interact with Linux. You know, we published a book called Introduction to the Command Line, you know, just as a tutorial for people who do have a bit of interest, you know, to sit down, and because you really only need to know a little bit in order to accomplish a lot. Um, especially for protecting yourself when it comes to things that people might try to do to manipulate on your computer with proprietary software. And, and this is Richard Stolman's traditional approach to this has been to encourage people to um, become literate in that way. Because you don't, I'm not, a, I don't have any formal programming training outside of, uh, you know, I took some basic classes in high school and learned some Pascal. Uh, but everything that I've learned after that has been self taught. And I don't, you know, I don't know that much. Because I should not compare to my peers, but I know enough to accomplish a lot in my personal environment. You know, you know a little bit. You can do some really nice configurations for yourself on your system. You can make your computer work the way you want to. And once people taste a little bit of that, it's such a different, you know, radical, radically different feeling from using a Windows or an OS X machine um, that it becomes, you know, it feels empowering. You can actually stop this program from doing something you don't like. You can actually see what this program is doing behind the scenes and get some idea of what might be wrong, why it's not working the way it went to. So, you know, we do still try to encourage that, um, even while we also want to make the software work so that people don't have to, you know, you, you shouldn't have to exercise your debugging skills when you're just trying to use a computer. But at the same time, if, you, you know, if your tire goes flat, you should know how to change it. Um, and we do want to try to push that idea with people as much as possible. And, and to help them, not in a punitive way, but, you know, we, we try to pr publish uh, documentation and. Uh, I'm hoping that in the future we'll be able to do some classes, you know, some little seminars uh, to help promote free software skills and teach people about free software. But even if the FSF doesn't, plenty of people in our community do. And we have professors at schools. Uh, we have an intern working with us right now who, as part of his coursework, um, was actually required to go find a free software project and contribute to it. Um, so people are helping to promote free software <coughs> in that way. But uh, the other stuff tries to do what it can there as well. So this is a, kind of a master list of the campaigns that we have going on right now uh, to accomplish these things. Um, working together for free software is uh, kind of our latest effort. Uh, it's, it's, it's designed to um, bring people together um, to promote common free software ideals along with the software. So, I mean, the, the way that I 
first got into free software was um, using Emacs, the text editor program. You can read, uh, Emacs came with a lot of uh, documentation, and the documentation wasn't just technical, it was also about free software ideas. You know, there was a, a manifesto that comes with it, basically, that explains free software movement and why it's important. And nowadays, um, you know, if you're using Emacs, you still see that, but if you're using, if you just install a GNU Linux distribution, you really don't see anything about that at all. Um, you install the distribution, it, it, it installs the software, and it doesn't really, you know, nothing really pops up to talk about free software or to ask you if you want to read more about free software. Um, and so we've had this idea that, and, and of course between different groups within free software, for those of you that are more familiar with it, I'm sure you, know, you can agree that there's a lot of infighting in different ways, disagreements about little things um, between distributions and, you know, plenty of people distributed with us about stuff, but we all do have some common principles. And so this is a campaign which is designed to pull people that are doing things in free software together and promote that as a group. Uh, and so far, in concrete terms, uh, we have an area on the FSS.org website that has collected some profiles of uh, individuals and organizations that are using free software. So we have a, you know, a stock exchange is listed on there, um, a, a, just a selection of organizations. And we want to build on that and, and help people see who the free software community is, you know, all the people that are using free software, what they're doing with it. And that will help people understand that you can use it for all these different purposes and, um, and that it's, there's all these shared things that, that make it strong and, and unified, even while it can seem somewhat divisive at times. Uh, and of course, other people are doing interesting things in this area too. I noticed recently that um, uh, when you install a Firefox based browser like Mozilla, they actually do uh, say something about software freedom when you install it, which is pretty cool. I mean, that, it's again that principle of, of having the software bring information about the ideas as well as software to your computer. Uh, can you, you already have talked about it a lot, but I, I do want to mention for those of you who are interested, we'll be launching a, a donations program in the next uh, month, I expect, that will enable you to make contrib contributions directly to your new projects that you might use a lot. So if you're um, you know, an avid Ganache user, for example, which is uh, Ganache is the new project to be a flash, uh, free software flash player, uh, you can make a donation directly to that project through the FSF. Um, and so that's something that people have been asking us for for a long time, and we finally kind of figured out a good, a good way to make it work. Um, and I'm excited about that. It's a project that I've been personally working a lot on um, because I think it's an important role for the FSF to play to help. It's, a, it's kind of a new version of what we used to do. You know, we used to, to pay programmers directly, and nowadays, um, People are very interested in supporting programs they use through these kind of micropayments, you know, small donations, uh, being able to you know, say, hey, I like this program, let me you know, give you 10 bucks to work on it. Which one of those is that you're referring to? I can hear the second one. Can you write it? Yeah. So if you do that work, um, you can get more information about the GNU project. And then on SF.org, we'll be putting up the announcements about the donations program when it's ready. Um, Defective by design. Uh, I wanted to, to go through a bit of the history on. Is it losing focus? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a strange thing for a window manager that is uh, frame based. Yeah. Um, so Effect by Design is a campaign that we launched in May of 2006, and it was to call attention to DRM, Digital Restrictions Management, uh, which is, of course, the software that is implement, usually used to implement copy restriction schemes of some kind, so it stops you from copying music from one place to another, uh, stops you from you know, uh, save, saving streaming media um, on the iPhone, stops you from uh, installing third-party applications, so we launched the campaign uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, you might wonder why the is doing it because it's not directly about free software. We, we actually didn't talk about free software directly too much in the campaign. Uh, but DRM, first of all, is always proprietary software. You know, you can't have the, the purpose of DRM is software that you install on someone's computer to directly control what they do with it. Uh, obviously, that doesn't work very well if you, at the same time, give them the source code for that. 
uh, to where they can, you know, modify it to stop restricting them. You know, it's essentially like giving somebody, trying to lock somebody up and then handing them the key at the same time. Um, it's not going to work. So DRM by its nature is proprietary. So just as being a specific instance of proprietary software was uh, one reason why the FSS wanted to highlight it. Um, but also, it was, uh, we were seeing something really disturbing happening, which is companies taking the free software, putting it on a device, um, for example, a television set, or a, a, a TiVo type thing, a digital video recorder, and um, complying with the letter of the license, uh, if somebody gives you free software that's licensed under the GNU General Public License, they're also required to give you a copy of the source code. Uh, so the, the companies would do that. They would give people you know, the, the box, they would be able to get the source code if they wanted it, but as soon as you try to modify it, and put it on the device, the device would refuse to run. So it was, and that's a form of DRM, right? It's, it's software that is uh, implementing restrictions on what you can do with the hardware, basically. So this was part of the reason why we wrote a new version of the, of the license, and that the new version of the license prohibits doing that, you know, basically. And we needed to build public support for that. Um, and to explain why also it was important. I mean, we're not just trying to like, you know, deceive people or to support our end, but this is actually an important thing that we wanted to, to educate people about. So we decided to take DRM, you know, on specifically. Um, we have about 27,000 members in the campaign right now, you know, people who are subscribed to the mailing list and who take part in the different actions that the campaign has periodically. Uh, we're still running it today, quite actively. Um, we've targeted lots of companies. Uh, in the past, and then also sometimes some public institutions, the Boston Public Library, uh, because we are trying to get libraries to stop um, partnering with DRM providers. So libraries which are getting into ebooks and uh, audiobooks are sadly right now working often with uh, proprietary companies that are requiring the use of proprietary software and a DRM for patrons who want to access them too. And that's very counter to the library's mission, you know, which is to uh, be a, a source for a public source for information and, and something very democratic. And libraries, you know, libraries helped to reform copyright law back when uh, when copyright law was being revisited. And we they're an important ally that we want to uh, have to work with. So, you know, we took that time to go outside the Boston Public Library and talk to patrons of the library about what the library was doing. Um, since then, things have gotten a bit better and a bit worse in that regard. Uh, better in the sense that a lot of the audiobooks are now available DRM to be in MP3 format. But um, now Kindles are coming into libraries, which are often now used as vehicles for DRM restricted ebooks. So that'll be the next step there. Um, it's been a campaign all around the world. We've had actions going on. Uh, most recent one we had was um, we were targeting Nintendo. Um, because Nintendo's new uh, small gaming device, the DS, DS2, um, comes with a, a set of terms which say that Nintendo can remotely deactivate your device if you are using it inappropriately. So, uh, for example, if they decide that you've modified the software on it or you've connected it to an unauthorized um, peripheral, uh, then they will brick your device. Um, and it also came with, because uh, the device is Wi-Fi capable, because it's on the network. Uh, it also said they will update it without notice to you over the network anytime it connects to the network. It also says that they claim some rights over anything that's on that device. So the device does have a camera. If you take pictures with it, Nintendo claims a license to those pictures. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so can you imagine the, the camera manufacturer telling you that if you take pictures <laughs> with the camera, they, they can sell those pictures, you know, without um, your permission, or put those pictures, you know, on their website or whatever. Um, so, and, you know, those are objectionable terms, and then those terms are all enforced by the software, so, which is DRM. Um, so the DRM is what prevents you from saying, no, I don't think you're gonna uh, take my photos. I will, you know, encrypt the photos on the disk so that you can't have them, right? Well, Nintendo, you know, let the software prevents you from modifying anything on the device in order to do that, even though that device, like all of these devices that we have now, you know, are, these are general purpose computers. Um, they're not toasters, right? They're computers that can run all sorts of kinds of software 
just the DS, the DS3 can run all sorts of software. So it's uh, these are these are software used to implement you know particular goals by companies, not any restriction of the device. So what we decided to do was that Nintendo was going to go go into the brick making business. Um, we thought we would send them some bricks. You know, um, we asked people to uh, donate a few dollars, and we would send a brick in their name. Um, I enjoy it, you know, I'm sort of a really prankster and stuff like this, and, and like it's fun. I get to actually get the message across, but I did wimp out at the sending real bricks to Nintendo because I was, you know, I'm supposed to run this organization responsibly, and I was a little bit worried that they might actually like complain about a pallet of bricks arriving at their office. So uh, we went with cardboard bricks. Um, they look like bricks, and you know they still get the points up. And uh, we, the way, and this gives a little bit of insight to the way that we think about this campaign and the way we run them. You know, we set some goals for this. And we're like, well, why are we doing this? You know, uh, uh, how will we know if we've been successful at accomplishing what we wanted to accomplish? And so we set some goals. You know, we wanted to send at least 200 bricks. Um, we wanted to raise uh, $2,000 to fund the campaign. Further, um, we wanted to get the issue mentioned in the news media. You know, even if they weren't, even if they didn't mention us specifically, um, the point of this exercise is to get this aspect of the device into, you know, in the media, so people will read about it and people will be talking about it, thinking about it. Um, and then, uh, final goal was to get some kind of response from Nintendo. You know, because that's. Uh, companies they will, they will always ignore you, you know, anybody until they have to do something about it. So if they if you get a response, then you know that one little response means that there was a lot of conversation behind closed doors about whether to issue a response or not, which means the message got into the company as well. Um, so this action ended up being really successful for us. You know, we got over 200 bricks, 220 something, I think. We raised over $2,000. Um, the issue uh, got picked up in quite a few publications, including um, New York Times. Uh, which didn't mention us by name, but uh, covered the issue with the device and an article about it. Um, and we know that Nintendo <laughs> was asked for comment um, because they issued a statement, first of all in Europe, um, because apparently they were contacted first in Europe, and the statement they issued in Europe said, uh, those terms are illegal in Europe, so they don't apply here. <laughs> oh, that's, that's great. You know, so, yes. Uh, that in itself was a victory because you know that's them admitting publicly that these terms. Oh yeah, we know they're objectionable. <laughs> um, so then they did also have the response in the U.S. Um, and the response was basically just you know don't worry about it. Like we're not going to actually use any of that stuff. Um, but it's a position that we shouldn't be in. You know you're not free if you're in that position in any, by any meaningful definition. If you're just trusting a company um, to do the right thing by you, then. You know, that's, it's not a good position, and more so, it's, it's one that's been demonstrated several times recently as a bad position to be in. Uh, Amazon deleting books in the, in the middle of the night from people's Kindles, mm -hmm. um, which they did with, ironically, they did with 1984. I'm not making it up. <laughs> they removed the ebook 1984 from everybody's Kindles who had it. Uh, and they had done it previously, even before that, with some Ayn Rand books. Um, so companies do, do use those things, you know, and that, that's the same kind of power that Nintendo is claiming. Nintendo says, well, we'll brick your device if you do something wrong with it. And then they're like, well, we wouldn't have to do that. But you know, we just thought somebody else in a similar space actually exercised that ability to delete a book. Now, Amazon had reasons for doing that. You know, the book was updated, uploaded in an unauthorized fashion or something. Um, but, you know. Did people actually pay for that book? Uh, I think it was a 99 center. It was, a, it was a cheap one, but they got you know they got refunds and credits and an apology from Amazon and uh, one student in particular that was affected by it. He had notes on the book because you can do annotations on Kindle, and his notes were all <laughs> um, So yeah, we just trust us is not a sufficient answer. Um, and part of the reason the story was successful at getting into the the media was because uh, it has been people have been talking a lot about the issue of ownership of things like photos that you take with these devices. And so we were able to, to kind of connect up with those stories. Um, people were talking at the same time about rights to Twitter, uh, Twitter affiliates <coughs> claiming they were photos that were posted at TwitPic, I think is what it's called. Um, and so, you know, us pointing out that hey, Nintendo was claiming the same kind of license over photos that you take with the DS was a good, it was a good moment to be doing that. Um, 
So we will also be uh, going to try to build on that success and um, do some more things towards ebooks in the near future. Uh, we also may have to return to Sony, who was a, another target previously, because they continue to do, I mean, really wild stuff. I mean, Sony uh, sold PlayStations to people uh, advertising that if you, on your PlayStation, you can install any Linux, you can install a second operating system. Um, and then they just remotely removed that feature from people's PlayStation. So people were upset about that. And so um, the more te technically capable people figured out how to add it back. Um, and that required violating the PlayStation DRM. And so Sony sent the police to the house. And so it's, it's uh, and then you know after that the network got taken down. Um, they have not changed any of the practices. You know, they're trying to entice everybody to come back after their network was uh, cracked. And you know, we we're trying to make the point that you know, take this as a moment to stay away from them entirely because we've seen types of things that they will do uh, to your device. You know, they're promising three things now, but later on, they can take them away. So it's definitely been one of our more successful. Um, campaigns. It's, uh, ad imagery has been an important part of it because we have tried to have a very, you know, a public this campaign has been very, very much targeted at, at non-technical people um, because DRM is one of those things when I talked earlier about, you know, moments when people suffer because of their proprietary software, they lose their whole music collection. You know, DRM is usually what's causing that. So this is that DRM is a good spot to connect with people. You, and then once people um, are on board about DRM, then you can talk further about other kinds of proprietary software. Uh, you know, the early victory in this campaign was getting DRM off of iTunes because um, we were targeting Apple and the uh, record labels pretty much exclusively for the first several months of the campaign. And uh, then eventually Apple did get rid of DRM on music on iTunes, but they still are using DRM on video and on, uh, on iTunes, and they're still using DRM on software. So applications that you install on your iPhone, iPad, those types of things still have DRM on them. But getting rid of it on music was a, was a big victory. Now, we won't claim sole responsibility for that, obviously, but uh, we did um, do a lot in that area. I have, I brought some of these um, stickers <coughs> up. If uh, anybody wants them, feel free to take them, please do. This is our newest sticker, uh, Steve Jobs. I don't know if that, if you all have seen the Apple commercial from Things on, yeah, on YouTube. It so. looks sort of like this. Uh, and it's just you know, it's interesting because that was when Apple was like the countercultural, you know, they were the, the radical anti-establishment company. And so this was kind of like uh, Apple breaking conformity and, and giving people freedom, you know. And now they've sort of come around to being uh, some of the worst offenders for trying to control what people do with their systems. So aside from the um, campaigns that we do, uh, we also have maintained some resources. Um, and these are really important things for us. I mean, a lot of the public attention that we get is about our campaigns. And you know, sometimes people object to things that we do, or, you know, come across as too negative. Uh, people, for example, suggest that we shouldn't spend so much time criticizing Apple or Microsoft, or we should instead say positive things about free software and help people understand how good free software is. And um, that's where this stuff comes in. I mean, these resources are the things that we provide to help promote free software on a daily basis, help get more people using free software, and to substantively help it get developed. Um, so we have the Libre Planet Wiki, uh, the RePlanet.org, and this is a, a project that's been evolving over time. And, it's a, a wiki where we're working to build a community of people who want to co co cooperate with each other on free software advocacy. Um, and that involves a both getting together by geography. So for example, like this group, um, you, know, you guys get together and, and talk about Kinu Linux um, because you're in the same general area. Uh, so we were trying to encourage people to form groups, other more groups um, like this based on where they live. But we're also uh, working to get people to be able to organize with each other around issues and being um, people who use the same program, you know, and want to share tips with each other, uh, people who are interested in free media formats and want to try to get to get uh, more sources using those. Um, so check it out, and you know, we're it's a work in progress for sure. I mean, it's a wiki, I guess, by definition. 
But uh, if you ever are sitting there thinking, you know, I'd really like to write uh, a letter to my school, you know, and complain about how they're making me use words, uh, this wiki is a great place to just write that. And then once you've written it, someone else might come along and see it and send it to their school, or they might improve on it. Um, and that kind of collaboration can happen. We also have the Libre Planet Conference, which happens once a year, and some of the events. Uh, we'll be doing it again this year in 2012 within Boston or Cambridge, but Boston area. So uh, there's a mailing list you'll see on LibrePlanet.org. You can sign up in order to be get announcements about the conference. It'll be sometime, usually in March. Late March is when it happens. And uh, I hope you come up for that. The Free Software Licensing and Compliance Lab, we uh, well, you know, when I talk about people not wanting to know to interact with their technology, you know, another area people don't want to interact with is the law. Right. You know, you would prefer not to have to think about copyright law or uh, how licensing works if you don't have to. If you're just a developer who's trying to write a program to share with people, you know, you really don't want to have to worry about those things. But there are rules about it, so we um, provide uh, free advice to projects, free software projects, and developers, and we help them work out licensing questions. So that uh, they don't have to, or if they do, you know, generally are self-sufficient, but have a question about some weird case, we can help them with that. And we, uh, for example, recently we've been getting a lot of questions about the interaction between free software and uh, uh, free software licenses and app the application store rules for things like Apple or the Android market or the Microsoft App Store. So we help people sort that out. We also do provide that service on a paid basis for companies. Um, who are maybe making a mix of proprietary and free software. So, you know, we don't really support that they're making proprietary software, but if they, we do support that they're using free software with it. And if they are going to do that, we want to make sure that they're doing it in the, in the right way that conveys all the freedoms that need to come with the free software. You know, so you know, a, a group shipping TV, a company shipping TV sets can talk to us, and we'll help make sure that they're you know using, uh, complying with the free software license for the code they're using in the right way. Um, but of course, since we are a charity dedicated to free software, we require some you know, payments for that so that we're not spending our donors' money um, helping people make proprietary software. So it's a useful service. Um, and we also, on the flip side of that, investigate violations. Uh, if you, um, you know, this whole idea of copyleft, uh, we have copyright, and then what free software, what the new general public license does is, is flip that on its head and, and use the power of copyright to say that you are in fact allowed to share the software, and what you are not allowed to do is tell other people that they're not allowed to share the software. So uh, a licensing violation in this case is not someone copied my software. A licensing violation in this case is uh, someone is sharing my software, which is good, but they are not sharing it uh, in the right way with others. They're not giving the source code out. Um, they are shipping it, but telling people that they're not allowed to modify it. Um, so uh, we help investigate those issues and bring companies into um, compliance with the license. Um, and that's one of the things we do for the GNU project is GNU developers will assign their copyrights to us, and that empowers us to be able to uh, pursue violations on their behalf so they don't have to worry about it. We can essentially represent them um, in cases where their software is being used. The free software directory, uh, directory.fstep.org. This is a, a resource that I think it's really important and it's one that we haven't really paid enough attention to in, in keeping up to date. It's, uh, right now you can look at it and it's useful. You can, there's over 6,000 programs listed there. Every one of them has been looked at by a person to determine, verify that they are free software. Um, so you know that anything you download from there is free for you to use and free for you to share and modify. Um, so if you're looking for a program, like, hey, I'm trying to do a uh, voiceover IT, trying to do a video call to somebody, you can go there and you can search and you'll find some useful programs. Um, but it could be a lot better, and so we are going to be relaunching it in uh, the next month. And uh, it will be in a format, you know, previously when I said it, every one of the entries has been looked at by a person, that's great, but that also became a bottleneck uh, because we didn't have it set up to work so people could update it as well. So um, as search engines have gotten better and better over time, and our updates have got have only just you know stayed steady, we've uh, you know you, a lot of people would just prefer to use Google instead. Um, so we are going to be the, the relaunch version does a lot more to enable other people to edit it. So maintainers, uh, developers will be able to keep the entries that describe their own programs up to date themselves. Um, and people will be able to add you know interesting links and helpful tips and 
uh, all sorts of, of good things. So it, it hopefully this will become a much stronger resource for getting more people to use free software. Um, if you're trying to get people alternatives to something like Photoshop or you know, trying to help a, a local nonprofit or church group start running their operations on free software, it'll be a good resource for finding the right programs for them to use. Uh, and also, I'm also hoping um, uh, that it'll be a good resource for academics because there are a lot of people who are not writing about free software and um, they like to write about things like what programs are under which license or you know uh, how many programs are there that claim to do this function and, and the new form of the directory will be able to uh, out output all that information in machine readable format even so academics can get data basically out of the database. Uh, free software job page, uh, we advertise um, jobs that are about free software. So um, jobs where if you get hired, you get to work with free software. It's one of the things that we always have to answer when we're talking about free software is well, how to get people get paid. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of the answers to that question, but the simplest one is well, you can get a job working for a company that is doing free software, so or a nonprofit that is doing free software. So we uh, work on, on getting interesting listings along that, those lines posted there. And actually, this last one is um, now being transitioned to something else. The hardware directory, the purpose of this is to get people good information about uh, buying hardware that works well with free software. So when you're buying a new computer, you want to make sure that it's going to work with GNU Linux with free software. And uh, this is a place where you can go and say, okay, well, what wireless card do I need to get? You know, what video card do I need to get? And in order to make sure that it works. Because unfortunately, uh, you go to a store and you go buy a, a laptop or a computer, it's not going to tell you if it works with free software or not. Um, there are a lot of reasons for this, and some of them are political. Microsoft uh, stickering branding rules that say works with Windows um, prohibit uh, any claims about uh, GNU Linux. So if you have that sticker on your box, you cannot have a sticker about GNU Linux on the box. So, which means that since everything works with Windows, hardware-wise. Uh, there's not going to be any sticker that, you know, anytime soon that, that tells you that it's compatible. Um, there is a little bit of information out there now in some areas, and I'm not quite sure what, you know, Microsoft has multiple branding and stickering programs, so there must be one out there that uh, doesn't totally rule this out because you will occasionally see a little penguin on a box or something. Um, but obviously that information is not very readily available for people just shopping around in the store. Uh, so one thing we're doing to change that is to give information for people um, so you can at least look beforehand and know what you need to get. Uh, we've actually been working with a new project called hnode.com. H is in hardware and node.com. And they, uh, they're, they're doing a much better version of what we were doing. Um, so it has more hardware in it, it's more searchable, and you can go there and, and look for different components and you'll be able to find out what will work. Uh, but the other thing is we are actually promoting our own, hopefully, branding program so that uh, there will be companies who do want to have the FSS sticker on their box, which says that this works with free software, and they won't have the Windows sticker on the box. So. John, could you not be in restraint of trade, uh, the kind of sticker that you described with Windows? Uh, you would think. You know, and my actually particular complaint about those stickers, beyond just the rules that you, know, you can't have these other stickers on it, is the, uh, they say requires Microsoft Windows. Mm -hmm. and it doesn't require Microsoft Windows, right? Like, you know, the, that used to be even like on, on routers, you would the box would say requires, you know, uh, 256 so the software that comes with a thing that nobody installs that they want you to. You know, it comes uh, requires 256 megs and requires Windows and but of course the, the device doesn't actually require Windows. And, and that's what that's actively deceiving people into thinking that they need to have Windows in order to use this particular piece of hardware when uh, most of them have web servers on them anyways. Yeah. Well the prohibition that the Windows sticker prohibits the use of anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, isn't that somehow in restraint of trade? Does anybody challenge that? It's tied up with general monopoly status, kind of, right? Because yeah. it's okay, I think it's considered okay to have a, a, an endorsement program, um, which says if you have our endorsement, you can't have competitors' endorsement, right? I mean, I think that, that's been a pretty long standing practice. But um, when you're a monopoly, uh, then that becomes a whole different story, right? So. Yeah, I think it's a, an area where it could be challenged. Um, and of course, Microsoft did lose the you know, monopoly cases in the past. Is there a, are you talking in the back too? Um, I was just going to ask if you saw me even I was a little too restrained of trade, but I was going to ask if you saw any restrictions 
Yeah, and that, I mean, the, the terms are outlined, um, they're actually on the legal planet, which he, uh, if you look for our endorsement program, you can see the terms that we've drafted so far. Um, the, so it's not exactly that you can't have anything about Windows uh, on the box. Um, it's, you can't promote, uh, so you can say it's compatible with Windows, basically, um, but you can't have the, uh, the graphical sticker or the uh, or a, a larger promotion of it than for the free software. You know, because what we're looking for is, is not to rule out the technical information that says this device works with uh, Windows, but we are looking at the, the promotional aspects of what those stickers do. So, let's see. Do you need a broader browser window because then we can switch to the other machine? I've actually got it, yeah. Okay. One of the amazing things that's happened to me at Free Software in the last few years is I can successfully run two separate screens with different programs running on each screen. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so I mean it says, you know, what we, the way we worded it right now is uh, must not also carry endorsements or badges related to proprietary software. Uh, however, we don't object to clear factual statements informing the user of the product also works with specific proprietary operations. So, I mean it is, yeah, we are trying to get companies to support us uh, and not, you know, we're trying to get hardware companies to simply support free software um, and downplay proprietary software and that's definitely part of the goal here. Um, but it's not to like, you know, gag them from conveying information that is useful in certain circumstances. Uh, so HNode is a place where you can contribute if you're using free software now. Um, you can uh, share the hardware that you're using successfully. And then other people want to know that they can buy that as well. So there's a, a lot of ways, I mean, you know, the other stuff we have to is 10 right now. Uh, and we're bigger and smaller at different times, but that's usually around that size. Um, but there's a lot of ways that, uh, that you know, most of all the work is done by people who, who aren't that staff, staff basically. And we work with hundreds of volunteers around the world to accomplish all of these goals. And, you know, we just provide kind of a, you know, you know that if you write the FSS, someone's going to answer and we're a reliable, uh, organizer, you know, with consistent policies, we, we can help keep things moving, but we need more people to help out. And if you're interested in helping out, there's a lot of ways, you know, that, that emphasize all different sorts of skills. We have the new project itself, which if you're a programmer and you and you already have a program you're working on, you can submit it to be part of the GNU project. Uh, there's also programs that have been written by other people that are looking for somebody to care for them, kind of like orphans, so uh, you can adopt a program. Um, and or if you are not a programmer but you know a little bit about uh, web design or if you just want to know a little bit about web design, you can help out with the new.org website uh, by being a new webmaster. Um, and another program we have that I've really, been really excited about is our internship program. Um, I helped get that started a couple of years ago and now year round we are, uh, have an internship program that lasts each period of uh, three months long and people can come in, students, you know, usually, but uh, it's not limited to students. And uh, volunteer basically for three months at the FSF office and get that experience of working in the organization. Um, it's been a great learning opportunity for people to both learn technically about free software and also to learn uh, about working with the public and ideology and um, all the things that we do. So we have information about that at uh, volunteer slash internship. Um, it's, uh, you know, we have 10 staff right now, and we have four interns in the office this summer. And we have, uh, they've been actually, if you look at our recent blog posts on the site, they've all been introducing themselves um, the last few days. So we have a systems intern who's actually a software developer, computer science major, and he's working on, a, you know, a transitioning the FSS uh, online store to an updated version of the software. 
And so, you know, it's a great project. It's meaningful. It's a store is quite important to us. We sell um, T-shirts and books and things that get documentation out there and also help raise money for that. Um, we had a couple of interns working with the campaigns team, and they worked on the public advocacy projects. We have uh, one blind free software user, Jonathan, who is going to work during his summer project on some accessibility improvements to the GNU Linux distribution that we use that will be shared with people and help make free software more accessible to the blind. Um, we have uh, another intern who's working with licensing. You know, he's actually interested in the law, and um, so he's helping answer GPL questions and uh, doing a, a summer project of archiving some of the materials that were produced during the GPL v3 process the update of the license. Um, and putting those all together into a nice browsable form for history and for researchers. And then, you know, three months of that's commitment and uh, a lot of people are just looking to help out in smaller ways um, as flash volunteer. There's some of the other specific things that people ought to help us out with. And I'm happy to talk to anybody about um, ways to help with whatever time frame. And we are a charity, uh, 501c3, so we do depend on donations to support our work. Uh, the main donation program that we have is the membership program, um, which I brought some of the sign up cards here that you want to. And people will contribute uh, $60, well, $120 a year, $60 for students. You, know, you can do that over the month, $5, $10 a month. And that um, is the most stable source of our funding, and it's really what makes the FSF continue to run. And that's, you know, my job as executive director has a lot to do with fundraising, and that's really the program that I want to expand because. Uh, we're not dependent on corporate funding. You know, we do take uh, funding from corporations, patrons, that stuff, that org shows you some of the companies that make donations. But uh, we want to actually have all the individuals using free software and, and who support free software to be our primary source. Because, you know, it's pretty obvious. You can look at the patrons page and we have said, you know, we've had campaigns that have asked these companies to change practices. So the money certainly doesn't influence our policies and, and never will. But obviously, the individuals uh, help build the community in a, in a better way. And if you're not on the newsletter as a, as a free software supporter, um, I encourage you to sign up. We send that out once a month. And it's basically an aggregation of all of the stuff that we've done over the month, and then also other interesting free software news stories that might happen. So it's just a once a month thing, and um, it's a good way to keep up on what's happening. And especially if you're a donor, it gives you some idea of what we're working on. And, that, you know what that we're doing productive things with the sport that's given. Uh, and I think that that is uh, what I want to talk about. We can talk about any specific issues and um, questions. Um, you mentioned a couple times whole idea about what about all these other people who aren't programmed. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we're all being asked very early on is, you know, why would anybody in the right mind write software to give it and it's been becoming more obvious to me that that's not a very good way to look at software. I think we need to be telling people there's other ways to think about software. Um, you know, I'm an academic, and there's a number of projects that I'm aware of uh, where basically people who need the software and use it support it. Mm -hmm. It's not like they're selling it, they're not giving it away, it's just that they so from their point of view, they'd love to have us join them and support their effort. So they look at it from an entirely different point of view. Uh, how can we get people to join our project to support us? It really doesn't cost them anything to give the software away. So it's just an entirely different way of looking at software. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm just trying to think of how can we possibly change the, change the uh, paradigm. Yeah, I mean, it's a... Uh, it's, uh Jump in on that. Well, yeah, I, uh, what I've been working on and so I was looking at doing is I was thinking about that was how you make money on students that work free. Well, it's a technical thing that not everybody wants, like you were saying, not everybody wants to know how to software. Nobody wants to know how to fix it. Mm. So That's so where, yeah, you sell well, the support, you sell the install, you sell the fixing it afterwards. To keep it running, to keep it running smoothly, keep it updated. And that's where I think that, that the, you can give it away if you want to, or maybe sell it initially and say that, you know, yeah, you can, you can give it away after that. You bought the product. You can do what you want with it after you bought it. But after that, if you want to support with it, my time is running. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's interesting. 
just to follow that thought process, there's a number of large projects I'm sure everybody can think of, like the um, Bone, uh, Moodle, uh, of course the um, Eclipse project. These are large projects. I'm sure there's a large number of companies that you can turn to to get paid support if you want to have a contractor come out and help you. And you can have these com companies competitively bid uh, for you know, who's going to provide some services. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think the, the service, and that's a pretty uh, straightforward one for people to understand, and it's a, one that's been demonstrated to be successful. Um, and the whole, the web really has really helped make the case for that because you can see, um, you know, even individual developers making money off of writing WordPress extensions for people, right? And uh, WordPress is free software, you know, uh, for blogging, um, that it has an extension system so you can make it do different things, and, you know, the important to make to get the first point across, which is that free software actually enables a lot more people to make money off of software because the code is there for everybody, right? So that means if you're interested in it, you know, you didn't write open office, but uh, that doesn't matter. You can still start up a support business for it because you can see all the code there and um, if one of your customers actually has a problem um, that's you know, it's a bug in the code, and you can actually fix the code for the customer and send the contribution upstream. And you know, so it that's a, that's very different from a model where, for example, only you know, Windows you're providing Windows support, you're in the dark because you can't see what the code is actually doing, um, and you can't make mod you can't sell modified versions, you can't sell support for modified versions of Windows. Mm -hmm. So the proprietary model of you know, you're selling a box basically which has software on it and uh, only the authors of that software, you know, they can in turn authorize some other people to provide support for it, but for the most part it's a very limited economy. I've got a memory of coming across a website, I think it's called Bounty Programming. Mm -hmm. The idea is that there's at least one website where they list projects and they ask people to provide bounties. You know, in other words, if you, if you fix this problem, I'll pay you this amount yeah. of money. And you might have 10 people with the same problem saying, okay, we'll each pitch in 50 bucks or 100 dollars or whatever. And if you fix that problem, you get the money. Yeah, um, uh, there's a, a, a nonprofit, um, the database system that we use, well, we're using it for a lot of things and migrating everything to it, so we see around. Um, they are a free software project that's had a lot of success with a model, uh, I have a name for it, Make It Happen, I think is what they call it. And it's a similar kind of thing um, where but people will actually propose features and uh, say how much money they need to implement that feature. And then various users who want that feature will uh, chip in. And then, you know, if the, if the amount's reached, then the feature gets implemented and everybody gets, you know, what, what they want. Okay. I think that was a really good model. Of, and I, I don't know if it was, if, well, if you're doing it now on purpose or what, but with the, uh, it's just, uh, one of the subscribers when they found out that he hacks, mm. the sales of them jumped. Congratulations. Yeah, it was this one. Yeah, it's not a If you're able to, to do that, you, you should make a really good product with a lot of expandability. You don't have to do any, any uh, you know, um, development. You just let the people do it. And it, it just grows that way. You, you save money on, on development right there. You make a really good, strong product that can be expanded on. Yeah, you know, is create the product. That exposes its weakness and will sell the copies. Yeah, I, I didn't see them stop selling that, but they can start production of it again at one point or another. Really? I don't know. That's my story that I didn't know. Uh, the Buffalo um, is actually now selling a router which has, which shifts with uh, DBWRT which is the uh, free software you know, that people are installing on these. Um, they do still have some proprietary software completely unrelated to the, to the main router function that they put on it alongside of it, but they're shipping the router with, you know, so they're even skipping the step of like, make the people, you know, flash their own device. They're like, we'll give you the stuff on it already. Um, so that was pretty, that's the first example I've seen of that, and it's pretty cool to see. What about efforts to replace proprietary operating systems with workaround, workalikes, i.e. React OS. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, they're happening. Um, the 
Yeah, I mean, I guess there's sort of two different things. You know, one of one of them is the, the general work that a lot of people are doing to kind of make the application look and feel, you know, like what people are used to from the proprietary world. So, you know, GIMP is a free software graphics editor that um, you can use instead of Photoshop. And but GIMP had a very different interface from Photoshop, still does. So that's a, a turnoff for some people, you know, who are used put a lot of effort into learning the Photoshop interface. So there was a, another group that started a fork of GIMP uh, called GIMP Shop, I think. And so it was the same, you know, underlying software, but they changed the interface to look and feel more like Photoshop interface for the people who are familiar with Photoshop, you know, for could easily make the transition. You know, some people like that, some people didn't like that, uh, but that's the beauty of free software is mm -hmm. that you know someone can do that. Um, yeah. That's a Windows theme for yeah. yeah. So and then there's a and then uh, you see a lot of uh, movement happening in free software desktops right now to kind of not mimic I won't say but to, to adopt some of the, the practices from desktop proprietary desktops that have been successful you know like Apple's interface um, different parts of it but then like React when you're talking about that is a that's a whole kind of different category of projects which is actually providing like um, compatibility uh, for um, you know, like Wine is a, a Windows emulator that can actually run Windows programs uh, on under in free software operating system. So those things, um, you know, for, from our perspective, I think that they they can be a little bit distracting. I mean, we're not going to say that it's free software. React is free software. That's great. Um, Wine is free software. That's great. But uh, for achieving kind of the goal of a completely free software world, I think that we would rather have effort put into developing some key applications that free software still needs, you know, in order to, like, we, we still need a, a, a stronger Skype replacement. You know, uh, one thing I didn't mention is our, our high priority projects list, which you can see in the campaign section. And that's a list of um, areas where we think that these specific applications really need to either help or need to be written because they're things that are reasons why people can't make the switch to free software. So Skype is a one example, um, we have had a couple projects succeed. Um, recently we had a RAR, RAR v3 is an archive format that's proprietary and it's uh, popular for exchanging files in certain places on the internet and there was no free software support for the newest version of the format that got done. Um, and uh, Dinesh is another one that's on the priority project list because Flash is obviously all over the place. Um, and it, Adobe Flash Player is proprietary, so Dinesh was a replacement for that so that people could view the same Flash material that other people were viewing by using free software. So um, I think we would prefer to see that happen rather than you know, spending too much time on compatibility with operating systems that we hope are going away. Mm. Well, uh, one of the things I've been noticing is that there seems to be more um, cross-platform libraries. Uh, basically, so that way a project, uh, for example, like Audacity, or perhaps uh, OpenOffice, uh, or even Firefox for that matter, uh, it's not like you have to learn one special version for Linux and it's another version for any other operating system. It's the same, from your point of view, it's the same, from my point of view, it's the same program. Yeah, yeah that's been a huge help. Um, and our standard in GNU is that uh, we, we support um, software running on all operating systems, so um, multiple GNU programs run on Windows as well as on GNU Linux. Uh, we, but uh, we do want to be careful that we don't make the Windows version better uh, than the, the GNU Linux versions because then that uh, becomes a reason to use a proprietary operating system and the, the fundamental goal is still to make the whole stuff change. But the, you're right that the, the, the fact that you can use Thunderbird on both you know, Windows and Unix you know, has been, a, I think, a huge help for getting users uh, used to using, you know, free software. One of the applications I use uh, is called Octave, and it's, Octave is a kind of, an, uh, it's similar to MATLAB, but it's not really an attempt to be a clone of MATLAB. It's got kind of a long history, but there's this internal tension in the group. One group would like to be more like MATLAB, and another group would like to be more like MATLAB. And, uh, uh, the best version tends to be the version that runs on Linux or Unix. Uh, the Windows version is pretty is lagging behind. It's got some problems. And I hope it doesn't give us a black eye. Yeah. Yeah, it's a fine line. You don't want it to, to make the program look bad, you know, for people that are trying it out. 
Um, Octave will actually, it's one of the, uh, when I talked about the ability to donate directly to projects, that, that will be one of the first ones available. So, um, the, uh, and it's also on our priority projects um, because it's an important, you know, it holds an important place in software related really, you know, MATLAB has a, a big, which is what people use to a large degree, so. Mm -hmm. It's important. This may be more a suggestion than anything, John. Uh, when you get new proprietary software on from Apple or Windows, first thing that comes up is going to be a big phone um, license agreement. Right. Yeah. You know, I suspect that most folks don't bother to read them, mm -hmm. but you can scroll down to the bottom and say, okay, I agree. And if you don't, you can't use it, right? So I'm just suggesting that as a consumer service, if you could identify the uh, really nasty consequences that might be written in the fine print for us so we don't have to hunt for them when the fine. Yeah, I suppose this would be the problem affected by design. Yeah, that'd be uh, Yeah, so that's really good. Get a nasty contract. Uh, Send out a red flag because people don't read that stuff. Mm -hmm. so yeah, that's definitely part of the problem that we face. And uh, it's, those things are so surreal that people they don't take them seriously, right? It's like um, everybody, you know, a lot of people largely view it as legalese that will never actually be enforced. You know, it doesn't matter. Uh, companies just have to say that stuff to protect themselves. You know, so fine, no big deal. So yeah, with the Nintendo, you know, with the Factory by Design, we did. Pull out the specific quotes from the license and just that the yeah, so these are the problematic parts. But I think you're right that we could do uh, see more of that. I mean, sure, I don't want to read them. Nobody else does either. But yeah, and you know, our position is that people shouldn't have to. You know, but you may hear about it in your position where we might not. Yeah. Yeah. They, uh, so when we when we think about proprietary software, I mean, there's kind of, there's three different aspects to it. There's the copyright, which is the one that we end up talking about most often, and that's just, you know, the copyright law says that if you write a program, uh, it's your work and you can prohibit, you know, uh, this set of things to be done with it. So you can tell people they can't copy it, you can tell people they can't, you know, read it out loud, and you know, read your source code out loud, but you, know, you have that power. Um, can't mod can't uh, modify, can't share modified versions of it, because um, that's, you know, a derivative of your work. Uh, but then there's also contracts um, outside of copyright. Copyright is just a, a license. It's, a, it's defined in a law, and when you get a, license, a copyright license, it gives you some permission under that law. So I can give you a copy of my program, and I can say, okay, cop normally under copyright law, you wouldn't be able to share it, but I'm going to give you this license to share it. Um, contracts can impose you know, arbitrary, basically, conditions uh, as the terms of acceptance of the software that have absolutely nothing to do with copyright. So a contract is what says things like if you use the DS3 to take pictures, um, we claim rights to that. You know, and those EULAs, that the small agreements that pop up um, aren't just copyright, you know, they're also contracts. Um, and then also the third thing is that makes the software proprietary is patents, um, which I, didn't, I should have talked about more, but uh, software patents are a big threat and you know, you can see the battle heating up in the media between the different big companies, you know, Google and uh, was sued for patent infringement for Android, you know, Apple and Samsung, some of you are fighting about patents. Uh, but then think about an individual free software developer trying to write a program, mm -hmm. um, right. you know, and uh, patents, copyright, copyright law, it actually matters if you knew you were copying something. So. Uh, in order to prove a copyright violation, you have to actually prove that somebody, you know, uh, looked at your work and copied. You know, um, patents doesn't matter. Like you accidentally did the same thing that you know Apple already claimed rights to, then you know you've infringed their patents. And so a work of software has you know thousands of things in it. Um, any sizable work of software that are each one of which could be subject to a patent. And as an individual developer, you have no ability to you know, defend yourself against those claims. So that's one of the threats that we're taking most seriously right now. I mean, it's 
companies don't go after each other because they all hold patents and they're all violating each other's patents. So the way they deal with it is they say, okay, you know, we'll trade you this one for this one. Basically, like you can have the touchscreen interface, and you know, we can have this file system support, and you won't accuse us of violating, and we won't accuse you of violating. So they can cross license like that, but you can't do that if you're an individual who doesn't have a portfolio of your own. So um, we launched a campaign and software patents. And uh, if you go to patentsabsurdity.org, uh, that has a film that we produced uh, about software patents and about the problems with them. So it's a good educational tool if you want to share that with anybody. We would like to update that if we can get the funding to do it um, because it was produced before the Supreme Court mm -hmm. decision last year that um, affected software patents. And we would like to update it in light of you know, what's happening after the court decision. Hopefully we'll be able to do that. Another interesting thing about that film was that it was also produced using free software um, and it's in free format. So, so independent evidence that filmmakers can use free software to do things from start to finish. So these agreements, you know, they touch on all of those things, copyright, patents, and contracts. And so I think we need to address all of those things in order to really like get rid of the big ugly box that you have to extrude each time. My understanding is that the uh, publishers are saying to public libraries now, we'll sell you e-books, mm -hmm. but you can only circulate them for maybe a limited number of times. Like maybe you can loan them out 20 times, yeah. and then you have to come back and buy another license. Right. And I'm just wondering, when you think about things like that, do you think is the future of the public library? No. Um, so, I was, when I was thinking about this, uh, Amazon, um, a while ago, uh, they viewed a feature on the Kindle that they called lending. Um, which was, it's a response. It's one of the complaints. You know, one of the reasons we started this Fight by Design campaign is because there weren't enough people talking about DRM from an ideological you know, uh, this is wrong. Like when it, people were objecting to DRM, but they were objecting to it on the grounds of it's, it's a hassle. You know, it, the specific things that it does are bad. You know, if Apple only lets you have your music on five devices. That's not enough. Like it should be ten, right? Um, and so, in that vein of criticism, you know, people criticize ebook DRM because it prohibits lending. Right? It's, uh, you know, I used to go to lend my friend a copy of this book. Now I can't do that anymore. So Amazon was like, okay, well, we'll throw a little lending in there. Because the, the weakness of that line, of that way of criticizing DRM is it just results in little accommodations that are enough to diffuse the criticism. Um, game companies, you know, they, there was an Assassin's Creed or whatever that one was, they, you could only have it on three devices. Well, they upped it to six, and that like, made a bunch of criticism go away from them. So Amazon, they implemented lending, but lending was um, one for any given book, you could give that book. So one other person, one time, <laughs> right? Okay. Uh, for a limited amount of time, right? The lending period, and that other person also, of course, had to be a Kindle user, you know. Uh, and so they had to give that transaction gives Amazon information, right, which is useful in their marketing. Well, they know that I lent you that book. That means that now you're going to be getting recommendations from them based on that. It's a service to them. Um, and on top of that, it was all limited at the publisher's discretion as well. So the publisher could actually disallow lending uh, for any given title. So um, that's obviously useful, right? Uh, in all but some just, just decorative cases. So somebody started a website where you could go with your Kindle and it pulled everybody together to the point like people who didn't know each other, you know, could use the lending feature to exchange books with each other. So in that world, when you get, you know, if you get enough people together, then okay, maybe you can actually get some books that you want to read this way. As soon as people actually started making use of the feature in that way, Amazon shut down the website. <laughs> so they told the, it's called Lendl, I think, and they, they told them that they, they were abusing the terms of service and couldn't do it. But well, if you have a paper copy of a book, you can get it to somebody and they can read it. Right. And now you don't have any. Yeah, no, exactly. Well, they give it back to you and they're done, so you can get that. Okay. Um, but but thinking about this, you know, think about this a little bit more. What lending is not—it's not actually a good thing. Like we, we lend stuff because we have to, right? We lend stuff because there's only one of it, and you know, my my friend wants to read it. Well, here you go. But while my friend's got it, I don't have it, 
you know, and I want to look something up in it, or it comes back to me with a coffee stand on it, or, you know, whatever. Lending is a, a failure. Lending is a, a disadvantage of a physical object, right? So why now are we trying to replicate that in, uh, in an area where that problem is solved, right? Like, you can share uh, the advantage of digital ebooks is that they can be shared by anybody. So now, in theory, anybody in the world can have access to all of the books ever made, right? So that we can get into digital form. So why do we want to deliberately break that, you know? And then on top of that, try to advertise that as a feature. You know, it's a it's a real marketing twist, um, and it's a you know I understand where it's coming from. It's coming from trying to make these things parallel because they want people to adopt ebooks and get more comfortable with electronic books. But fundamentally, it's, it's not the right direction to be going in. And I like publishers to adopt electronic books, too. I mean, people who have the intellectual property have to allow it to happen. Right. So it, it's a real dilemma because if I, if I write a book and um, if I can't get revenue from it, uh, what's my intent to write a book? Right, like music performance used to be a good, good, good career before we had things like you know before the eight-track tape players. I mean, back think back. Well, I can't think back. Kind of <laughs> back like in, uh, I had friends who were, who were in high school in the forties, mm -hmm. when the guys all went off to the war. These high school players went out and played in swing band, and they were making more money than than both their parents put together, and probably the grandparents. I mean, back then it was a good job. Pay up income supporting. Music performance now is a, is, a, is a place where a few people make a lot of money right. and everybody else gets scraps. So, I mean, it, it, we, the recorded music was a game changer. You didn't have threat parties with bands anymore. Now you have threat parties with record players, mm -hmm. and TV players, and tape track players. So, the, the thing about DRM is I can see why it's, it's annoying, etc. But you have to do something that's going to satisfy the people that own the intellectual property. I don't know where that where that balance Wait, is. Wait a minute. What's this intellectual intellectual property stuff? It's a conglomeration of a bunch of different laws, copyrights, patents, and things like that that develop. It's this whole idea of intellectual property is a relatively new idea anyway, as I understand it. I think Stalin's written about it. Well, yeah. maybe I'm using the wrong term, but or it's copyright. Even or back in the 1700s, if you were a book author, you you could have a reasonable expectation of getting having some income from it if people wanted wanted it. Well, that's why, they, that's why they wrote had copyright laws though, because because somebody would have a successful book and some other publisher would come along and uh, copy it and, and sell it, not to the author. And, and so that, that's how the copyright yeah. law you got anyway. But why does that why does that mean you should Stay with the same, you know, legal framework that we had. You know, that 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 we have the people we have. I'm saying you have to have something that's going to satisfy the people that, that produce the art. But, well, I, I don't know about that. Why? Well, because if, if you just didn't give everything away for free, you're not going to have the same people doing the, doing the work. You're going to have a reduced number of people doing it, and you're probably going to have reduced quality overall. I, mean, I doubt that, but I think what you guys are both touching on is this whole idea of the paradigm. Is that, you know, how do we use computers? How do we use music? Uh, if, you, if we adhere to or believe the paradigm that the companies are foisting on us, then yeah, we'll have arguments like that. Uh, there's got to be other ways of doing business. There's got to be other ways of doing business. You know, we were talking earlier on, you know, uh, if, if there's a level playing field, then you should have a number of companies all be able to compete for selling the best product at the best price. And of course, the way that Microsoft would love to do it is no, they want to have a monopoly and only they sell us the software and the folks at Sony, only the, only us, you know, Apple, only, only they're allowed to put software on your computer. And yeah, it's, it's, it's not just the software and it's not just the copyrights. It's how do we do business? What's the very paradigm in which we go around and have our lives? It's, they want to control that. Yeah, it took the free software people a while for the, the, the ideas of how we make, how people can survive and make a living on the software. As you know, John was just talking about it with you. That took a while to, to come out. I mean, that idea didn't come out the day that somebody decided software should be free. 
um, some, something else, something has to happen for, for art as well. You don't support art, so I, you can't make money supporting, um, you know, a novel because there's, there's no support work. You know, the person makes it, and the other person reads it. It's, there's, there's no, where, where's, where's the, the business model has to exist at some level. The people, people who do the serious art music don't make any money anyway. And there's somebody who's a professional composer, and he said, oh, it cost me, you know, crossing. And this was many years ago, you know, $20,000 to, to write art music. And can you really say that some of these pop stars do is really serious music? I mean, I mean, gosh, I, mean I, I play music, and I, I used to you know, be an amateur musician myself. I didn't expect to get paid to do it because I enjoy music. And people are still going to do, still going to play music because they enjoy it. So, uh, you know, I don't know that anybody has a right to make money any more than people have the right to make money by making buddy lips if people, if, if the reason for them goes away. Well, if you're, if you're willing <laughs> to accept the fact that there's going to be less and less art, then that works better. Uh, no, well, I disagree.